All right, geographers, we are back with the second half of this course of the semester. I brought this up at the beginning of the semester, how uh, the first half, like everything up to, you know, what was supposed to be spring break, uh, everything we were tested on with the midterm, which by this point you've hopefully taken, uh, I'll be getting to grading those soon. God, like everything else, um, but that first half uh, was for about getting you to think like a geographer, right? That was the whole point, is to get you thinking spatially, to question um, not just what's going on, but where is it going on in those spatial relationships. So we covered that all right, with a bunch of sometimes abstract ideas, sometimes everyday stuff that, that made a little more practical sense, and then sometimes it got kind of wacky. Um, you know, like when we get into Lefebvre and production of space and that kind of uh, material. All right, but we did that. We're done with that. Now we are moving on to the second component, um, where we're going to look at the modern world around us. And to do this, we'll go back in time. In some cases, we'll talk about stuff that happened thousands of years ago. Sometimes it's stuff that happened in World War II and immediately after that. And then some things we'll be talking about, you know, are happening right now. We'll be discussing this whole COVID-19, you know, not just the pandemic. Really, I mean, honestly, the, the medical component of it uh, isn't what interests me at all. Uh, what What's fascinating is our you know, economic response to this uh, situation. And so we'll talk about that because fortunately we're going to be talking about uh, industry and development and globalization and all these things that are directly related to what we're experiencing now. All right, so some of this will be quite immediate, quite practical for you, hopefully to listen along and you'll get a, a better sense of what's going on around you. So we'll be discussing that. Uh, but the whole idea here is that with all of these things, whether it's current events or you know, recent history or ancient history or whatever, um, we're going to be doing this as geographers. All right? So you might cover some of the stuff in a history class or a political science class or sociology or whatever. You've probably been exposed to a lot of this information, these, you know, these concepts or these topics or moments in time before, but you've also probably never looked at this as a geographer, as someone who is, is attuned to that spatiality, right? Not just what's happening, where is it happening, All right, That's what we're getting into. So to start this off, uh, we'll, we'll start with agricultural stuff here. I'm also going to link to some movies uh, that I'd normally show you guys in class, but hopefully I can find them freely available or something close enough to, to also get you thinking about the uh, you know spatiality of some of this stuff. But to start with, in terms of a an official lecture, we're going to get into agriculture. And you can see, just based on the title alone, it says Agriculture Part 1, uh, then we're just going to do Part 1. All right, we ain't got time for part two, which is, I don't know, it's just an extension of this stuff. Um, but we're going to move on to other things, just because we're, we're running out of time here in terms of the time left to, you know, take this class and all that. So we'll cover um, a good chunk of stuff. I've, I've kind of stitched together some of the stuff I would have talked about in part two into part one here. So we'll cover a good amount of agriculture, how it's geographical, and also why we should care, and right? why we should focus on this stuff. Because honestly, I think for most of us, we don't think about this stuff at all. Um, I mean, you know, maybe you do. Maybe you uh, live in a more rural part of the Antelope Valley. Maybe you're on one of the few little farms that still remain in this area. Um, so maybe you're thinking about it, but for most of us in our everyday, you know, suburban lives around Lancaster, Palmdale, or whatever, we tend to overlook the idea that agriculture, just this basic idea of 
growing food uh, is fundamental to life continuing. All right, and we're starting to, you know, pay attention to this a little more. Um, maybe in terms of you may have seen like news stories of dairies dumping out milk to, uh, uh, you know, maintain the 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 cost. Right, it gets into that whole supply demand stuff. So at a time when you can't find milk on the shelves in some grocery stores, you also see dairy farms dumping stuff out so they don't produce as much. I mean, it does, and we'll get into, you know, like I said, industrial stuff and, and the economy and, and globalization and all that. We'll cover more of that stuff, why we have these seemingly absurd things taking place. But the key thing today is just, like, we need food, right? We need a steady supply of food coming in. And for most of us, we don't, um, we tend not to think uh, about, you know, needing to produce food because we don't work in that sector, right? We work in something else. And then we get the money uh, from doing that something else and we go off and we buy food, right? And that's just how society works. And traditionally, we've had this divide between, you know, the urban and the rural, where if you're in the city, you're doing city stuff. You're, you know, very uh, urban in the sense that you're not working the land. You're not in tune with nature. And so agriculture, which is connected to nature, even though we'll briefly talk about it, it's not, it's not really nature in that classic sense that we have because of domestication. Uh, but it's uh, the idea that, that rural areas are where all of this, you know, nature-y, agriculture-y stuff takes place. And we shift stuff from, um, you know, the rural area where it's produced over to the urban area where, you know, the important people can uh, get their food and go on and do their important city stuff, right? That's kind of like the 1950s idea of how this stuff works. We'll get into a little bit uh, about urban agriculture, though, which is, well, I don't want to say it's a growing area of interest. Like it was when Michelle Obama put a, uh, uh, you know, a vegetable garden on the White House grounds, right? So back in like 2008, um, 2009, we started talking about urban agriculture a little bit more. It hasn't gone very far. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that at the end of this stuff. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, now, one thing, and I did link this on Canvas, but this um, actually, you know, was... I, discovered uh, last semester you can see the date um on here but it's this new yorker article that that freaked me out um a little bit and every now and then there's something that kind of clicks with stuff that uh um you know i've been thinking about and it, it gets to the point where it, it freaks me out a little bit so i started sharing this with students but you can see here it's the age of robot farmers and we hear this so often about robots taking over jobs and stuff like that. Um, typically, it's been a case where, like, a robot, if it can take your job, you didn't have a very skilled job to begin with. Um, and that's no offense to the people who've lost their job. It's just, we'll get into high skill, low skill stuff. How much training do you need? How many, how many years of schooling? But a lot of, like, assembly line manufacturing stuff, you can get trained quite quickly. That's how these things are set up, right? Um, but then, you know, people start to develop, you know, robots, like mechanical robots more and more. And they're able to do these very simple, repetitive tasks. And so we don't need humans to do that. And while there's an initial uh, um, investment in purchasing one or multiple robots to do this work, eventually it, it pays off because the robot doesn't need you know, healthcare or even, you know, a wage in general, and it can work all the time. There aren't labor laws, you know, limiting how much this robot can continue to work. So, of course, businesses, uh, you know, manufacturing companies, anybody uh, who can use a robot is going to want to do it to keep costs down and therefore profits up, right? But then there's this other stuff where it's been, you know, these realms where you just can't have robots um, doing the work, because frankly, robots aren't that good, right? And that's where agriculture used to be, or at least some, you know, key components. Uh, in terms of produce, you couldn't have robots, because big, clunky, 
um, you know, hard mechanical claws or hands or whatever would destroy the food, right? Same thing like textiles have, have resisted a full automation process because, you know, soft materials, it's harder for robots to work with that stuff than more rigid things. So we can have robots help build cars, but not necessarily make clothes in the same way, right? And it's not to say there aren't, you know, automated processes and, and machines that assist, but you still need more humans involved with this soft stuff, at least historically, All right? But seeing the picture right here from the uh, uh, article, you can see uh, there is a, a robot claw, looks kind of creepy, and it's, it's just cuffing, cradling this ripe strawberry, um, not damaging it in any way. So we've actually gotten to the point where robots are more advanced and they're able to handle this stuff. They're able to do things that hadn't been, um, you know, possible for this automation to take place. And a lot of the reason why we've gotten to this point when it comes to agriculture is because of labor and immigration issues, right? Here in, in this country specifically is, I think, where they're looking at. Um, but it's the idea of building a wall between the U.S.-Mexican border <clears throat> you know, the whole point of doing that is to keep certain people out of this country. But at the same time, those people who we're trying to keep out with the wall are the people who would, you know, be working in some of these lower skilled, more menial, grueling, awful jobs like the picking of produce, right? Um, but farmers are getting frustrated because they can't actually get people to come in and, and you know, pick the produce and, and do all of that. So they're really interested in, and, and the whole industry is really interested in developing robots. So this whole immigration thing doesn't become an issue anymore. So this is where the funding has come from. This is why we're starting to see this now. All right. And that's, that's one thing, like with innovation in general, quite often it's connected to the rest of what's going on in society. It's not that just, you know, some brilliant robot scientist was sitting around one day and said, aha, strawberries, this is how we'll do it, and, and it just came out of nowhere. No, it's being driven. The reason why these these researchers and, and engineers are able to do this work is because the money's there, because we have this, we're at this current moment where immigration from Mexico, Central America, Latin America in general, uh, it's being reduced or limited uh and we may we may talk about this more and more i don't know what we're going to talk about to be perfectly honest we'll, we'll probably get to it uh but anyway it's the idea that you know it, this is all happening for a reason at this moment uh, but what's also incredible is that we have the technology that allows this to take place so you know going back 20 years ago 30 years ago um, when we really start, actually, what, yeah, actually 40 years ago now, when we really start as a society looking at limiting, um, you know, immigration from Mexico and the rest of Latin America, uh, we didn't have this technology. We didn't have GPS and LIDAR uh, and these incredible technologies that allow us to, to develop machines like this. And it's, kind of, it's the same stuff that's allowing self-driving cars to be developed and tested. Same thing is going on with these, these uh, you know, strawberry robot things. So GPS, it's telling the, the robot where it is. LiDAR, where it's this light sonar radar kind of thing. So it's emitting, you know, little lasers are shooting out light, and it's bouncing back, and so it can tell where it is and what obstacles are there. And there are photos there, so it can uh, analyze, you know, just how ripe the strawberry is and all that. The technology has kind of met the, the social conditions to allow these agricultural robots to, you know, come to be, all right? And this, I mean, I, I like I said, I linked to the article in Canvas. I encourage you guys to read through it just because I, I just think it's fascinating. Um, but what's also fascinating is the author is, is really treating the robot as if it's a living being, as if it's like another you know, organism in this field, just like a, you know, a farm laborer going out and, and picking the stuff. It's, you know, describing 
the robot as if it's contemplating, like what to do. Uh, and so it gets in to, uh, you know, it can see it's got the cameras, so it can see berries and it can analyze if they're ripe or not, but it can also look through leaves, right? Because it's, it's not just taking a picture like we would if we, you know, pull out our phone and take a picture. You've got this multi-spectral analysis and infrared uh, capabilities and all that. So it can look at a plant, see through the leaves. Um, it makes a virtual 3D map of it, um, you know, in this instant right here. And then it just picks them. And this, this second one, I love it. It was only at the very end of the eight second window that the pitzer wheel dropped down and in a blur of motion that recalled Dr. Octopus, the Spider-Man villain, attacking one of his victims, the claws grabbed and picked the ripe berries in a fraction of a second, pop, 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 and deposited them, apparently unbruised, on a shelf at the top of the machine's chassis. Then the robots moved on to the next plant in that row. That's, that's awesome, right? And here's a picture. It's, it's lamer, um, because when you come back here and it's like, Dr. Octopus, and it, it sounds like this incredible scary like matrix looking robot it, it looks like i don't even it looks like a trailer um it's it's not a sexy robot which is you know that needs to be worked on clearly it needs it needs a better image but that's that's the thing right there and it's able to move through not harm the plants not harm the produce <clears throat> it's incredible just what can be done and and so this will be great to bring you know, the costs of food down eventually when these things actually get more, you know, manufactured costs come down of the, the machines themselves, farmers are able to able to implement it. And it, uh, you know, on the one hand, around California, Southern California, you know, we, we quite often um, lament the, the cruelty that's going on with people working out in the fields, how hard that work is, how awful it is, um, you know, in the summer months in the heat and the long hours and the physical activity and there's no stability to the job and all that. So you can say, good, these are terrible jobs. We can let the robots do it. At the same time, then we have to say, well, okay, wait, what happens to these people who needed this work, right? And it's not a case of, of somebody says like, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to go out and pick strawberries. That's my career path. No, this is what people do because it's what they can do and they're desperate and they need the work and all of that, right? So there's that clear issue of just people working um, and to simply say, well, then these people can go, you know, get another job or go to college or whatever. Like, no, that doesn't work as simple as that. We watched Roger and me. We talked about how, you know, the wealthy out of touch people, their whole attitude toward um, the poor uh, or the, you know, the laid off auto workers or whatever was just get up. Do something with your life. Get, you know, every day's a new day and, and that kind of useless garbage. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with what we're um, seeing here quite often with this stuff. So we got to think about the labor aspect, but it also, from a, you know, student perspective, you should also be thinking about like, oh my God, this, this robot, like five years ago, we wouldn't have thought this was even possible. Right to have this specific type of manual labor, um, you know, replaced by robots doing the work. As you're going through college and you're going through your GEs, you're picking your major. Well, I guess you guys already had to declare your major and like stick to it because we're ridiculous about that. Like honestly, even if they force you into a major, try to if you can try to wiggle around. Right, nobody at eighteen especially should should you know say um right off the bat okay this is what i'm gonna do i changed my mind like five or six times in the first two years of of uh college because you know that's the whole point you're being finally introduced to stuff so as you're going through you're at abc you're doing all your ge stuff keep that open mind think about what it is you want to major in and then what you want your career to be right don't just think of a job i, I yelled at my son um uh, the other day, because he was saying, like, he wants to go to college so he can get a job, and, you know, blah, 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 and, uh, and I yelled at him, as I often do, uh, because it, that idea of just a job, a job, just getting a job, it's not, it's not a healthy way 
to approach stuff. Um, this is the kind of reason Iggy Pop song uh, about having a job. That really, you know, kind of sums that up. Um, where anybody can get a job, and a job is quite often miserable and awful, and honestly, no one should ever want a job. And no one should go to college to get a job. What you should instead do is try to have a career in something. Have some kind of meaningful thing you do with your time, right? Uh, so try to think of, like, you know, who you are, uh, and then, you know, how you're going to bring that to the world, right? Anybody can go get a job and get enough money to pay bills, at least initially. And you're kind of setting yourself up for this miserable experience. But that also, that goes into, like, any robot at this point can do a job. Right, so your job can be replaced by a robot in some capacity, and the art author of this article uh, is also kind of, you know, hinting at that, getting at that uh, idea um, that as a journalist, you know, quite often, like anybody who who uh, you know uses their brain for a living, quite often the thought was you can't have a robot think for you, because the whole idea of artificial intelligence um, has been such a you know, far off idea for so many years that that was like, uh, not my lifetime. But now we actually see there are robots. And that's this kind of broad concept of robots. They're not machines, you know, that are moving around like typing at a keyboard or whatever. Um, it's computers, it's AI in a computer, it's a program, um, or an algorithm or whatever that can actually go in uh, and take some key facts and write a, a you know, passable news article on this stuff. So everything can be replaced, uh, you know, to just to write the news in this case. Uh, it would be quite easy. Like, honestly, as a professor, um, you know, I don't, I don't trust Siri at all or Alexa or any of these different, uh, um, you know, robot ladies that exist uh, in these different things we can buy and put in our homes. Because honestly, that's going to be the next teacher, um, you know, at some point. That's the concern where you can just say, you know, hey, uh, Alexa, um, you know, what's what's the deal with agriculture? And she can give you all sorts of lists on, on stuff and, and teach this stuff to you. The difference, of course, is, is that, you know, Alexa, at least at this point, um, will just give you some facts and some, you know, kind of readily available facts, the way I can keep my career going and try to be irreplaceable, which I know is, is naive as hell, and I'm probably, it's already probably being worked on, but it's the idea to like have my own voice on this stuff or to present stuff in a way that, that no one's ever thought about before, right? So that's, that's what I'm trying to do to avoid being replaced, to try to, to maintain this value in this very, um, difficult uh, economy. And we'll talk about, you know, the, the, the mechanics of, of our kind of mainstream capitalist U.S. and global economy. We'll talk about that later. But that's what you should be thinking about. I, I know I'm rambling. I, I haven't talked to anybody outside of my family in a while. Um, so that's what I'm going to do with you guys is ramble quite a bit. I'll try to focus. But the idea, to bring it back, is to think about this idea of that difference between a job and a career, uh, and really be aware as you're going through it, as you're planning for your career, constantly be thinking about, okay, how can I be replaced, right? Either by someone in another country who's making, you know, significantly less than I am and doesn't require, you know, healthcare and, and stuff like that, or how can I be replaced by a robot, like an actual mechanical one, or some computer that's getting better and better at thinking, right? So th this is just a little, you know, apocalyptic, depressing, dystopian stuff for you to, to think about as we as we start. Okay, um, let's let's move on. Let's get. It's not all depressing. I'm sure, there'll be some good stuff we talk about here. So let's get get into it. Um, so agriculture, as we start to discuss this stuff. Um, what we're looking at is the uh, domestication of plants and animals to produce resource surpluses. And so clearly I've got two key words here 
and I've pulled out domestication, which means that the plants or the animals, right? So whether we're growing corn or you know raising cows to to slaughter and, and turn into hamburger or whatever, uh, with that, uh, the domestication idea is that these things used to be wild or they have wild ancestors, but the plants themselves, like corn today, it's domesticated. It's been transformed. It's a new thing that exists through deliberate you know, breeding practices by humans. Right? It's, it's called artificial selection as opposed to Darwin's natural selection. But it's where humans play this role of coming in and artificially selecting for certain traits, right? To produce, you know, better food, bigger amounts of food, tastier food, stuff like that. And honestly, that's, you know, when we're dealing with animals, uh, we domesticate these things, artificially select traits to make things a little more tame, um, to make them a little more robust so we get more meat um, from them, you know, stuff like that. All right, so that's the domestication concept. It's the idea that the plants and animals that we are consuming, or even, you know, you, you know pets, um, you know, horses, uh, or dogs, or cats, or whatever, these things have been transformed into, you know, either a new breed, if not a new species, of organism, all for our, you know, own gain, right, to help our society, our economy. Right? And then surpluses here refers to the idea that we're not, you know, living on this kind of day-to-day -day, um, yeah, concept of producing food, right? With real agriculture, what we're trying to do is produce extra food that can be sold or given to people who aren't responsible for producing the food, right? That's how, you know, for most of us, we don't actually make our own food that we eat. And that's because there are surpluses that are produced that we can then buy, right? As well as produce enough so that things can be stored. We don't have to be constantly growing stuff all the time, right? So we can harvest things and store it and then, you know, dip into that throughout the year. So we have enough food to go all the time. So we can have a sedentary lifestyle, right? We don't have to be nomadic and move with the seasons and stuff like that because we have enough food to store and to also, you know, effectively, ideally, um, you know, sell to or give to everybody in society, right? So that's the idea with agriculture here. Okay, now with agriculture, we're going to kind of go through the world, go around the world and see these different types of agriculture. We'll be looking at um, Sweden cultivation first. Uh, which is connected to these lowland tropical regions, so stuff around the Amazon here, the Congo. We see it in, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, areas in Southeast Asia where there's a very specific climate and ecosystem at work. We'll talk about rice paddy stuff up here in, in East and Southeast Asia. We'll look at a lot of stuff that's going on in the U.S. So we'll kind of hop around, get a sense of how some different farming styles take place we're not going to dwell too much on the where this stuff is because that kind of gets into the whole you know as, as steve graves would say the subject of geography where we get too fascinated by the memorizing you know facts um at the expense of you know thinking like geographers right so we'll kind of I'll, I'll show where some of this stuff is but as you'll see we'll spend more time just thinking about the so what uh of all of that so to start with, we have Sweden cultivation, and I've got you know as you as a uh, um, you know Western uh, you know Southern California people viewing this, uh, I'm assuming uh, you look at this, you see this burned area. This should look kind of depressing to you, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily need to be depressing. Now this is on a, a much larger scale. Uh, this is where it's kind of gotten out of hand, but I like this picture just kind of fit the, the frame here. But still, it, it involves fire. And as we'll briefly get into right now, we'll see that fire is not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to 
you know, agriculture and, and surviving and, and all of that. And so Swidden cultivation, uh, it takes place, as I said earlier, in these lowland tropical regions. So like the Amazon basin up here, mainly in Brazil, but stretching, you know, into Peru and Bolivia and around there, just stuff on the, <clears throat> the eastern side of the Andes. Uh, that's, you know, that's an area where we see this take place. It actually, it originates in Southeast Asia, but and we see it in, still there, we see it in the Amazon, we see it in the Congo. Although, there's some discussion that, uh, you know, that some of this stuff might have happened actually here. There's actually a new study that's looking at pushing our ideas of, of the origins of uh, agriculture in South America further back than we originally thought. I, I'd talk more about this if I did the part two stuff. I'm not going to. It doesn't really matter. Um, but it's the idea. Anyway, look, the point is it's in these tropical rainforest areas. And so it's called Swidden cultivation. You know, officially, it's also called shifting cultivation as well as slash and burn, right? Which we'll see. Like I think I have, yeah, here. This will help explain it. Um, so it's the idea that first, if we go to the upper left and work clockwise here, uh, first we slash, right? You cut down some of the forest, okay, in this area right there, and then you burn it, right? Hence that whole slash and burn uh, idea. And the reason why you burn it is because soils in the Amazon, as well as other, you know, lowland rainforest uh, areas, the soils are garbage. And it's because of all the rain that comes through. It actually washes a lot of the plant food away, all right? Because all this rain is coming down, like over 100 inches of rain throughout the year. It's constantly raining. Stuff is, is getting pushed through the soil and into, you know, groundwater and out into streams and, and all of that. Just kind of that good, healthy soil that we tend to think of for agricultural regions like in the Midwest or throughout Central California. It just doesn't exist here. And that might seem bizarre because it's a rainforest, we're crying out loud. We see more biodiversity here than anywhere else. You can just see all the incredible plants that are growing. But a lot of those, they've evolved to effectively make their own compost, to trap, you know, waste and, and allow that to kind of, you know, turn into the plant food. And then these things are able to grow, right? But in terms of agriculture, we want to actually, you know, domesticate or, or plant our own domesticated products here. Uh, we need to fertilize the soil. And so the best, easiest way to do that, you chop stuff down, you burn it. Okay. And so that ash is going to fertilize the soil. And you've got a good four, maybe five years of just productive soil at that point. And oh, in fact, actually, it's not clockwise. So let's, we'll go here. We burn it, then we come down here to uh, um, this one in the lower left corner. So that's where it's actually, you know, being farmed, right? And that is, you know, good Americans, that probably doesn't look like a, a proper farm, right? With rows and order and all that. Then that's how a lot of this stuff works, where you throw everything in there, bigger plants help protect the smaller plants. And so you've got domesticated plants being grown. Well, like I said, four years, maybe five years, you got a good run. But eventually, all of that plant food is going to be used up. And so you just abandon it, right? You just let it go. You, you just say, okay, we had a good run. You leave it, ideally for about 20 years or so. And in that time, it will return to healthy, normal uh, uh, rainforest, right? Which is what this symbolizes here. So you cut it, burn it, farm it for about four or five years, leave it alone for 20 years. And in that meantime, while you're letting this original thing return to normal rainforest, you just move over a little bit right here and cut this down and burn it, right? Hence that shifting cultivation idea. So you'd farm, you know, this area right here, work that for another four years or so, abandon that move over here, do that for four or five years or so, abandon that. You kind of keep moving around. And so if you do this properly, you're not really harming the forest in any way because you're allowing it to, you know, 
be you know cut down in one area but it, plenty of it comes back it doesn't really affect the area and it's it you know perfect for the humans that are occupying this space and this is traditionally done for sustainable purposes right not to have you know mass produced stuff that you're going to go sell at markets it instead is a way to uh um you know just have food for yourself right just just for your family uh and so looking at this in in kind of traditional settings it's been totally fine for the forest itself now a lot of people today look at this practice and they are disgusted by it um you know just simply a you're just cutting down the forest in general uh, and setting it on fire that's bad we learned that early on you've got frankenstein um who helps teach this to us uh fire bad you've got bambi uh i don't know if you guys have watched bambi the disney cartoon it's phenomenal um in fact my oldest son the one i was just yelling at about wanting to get a job uh, he went through a period where he loved Bambi, and we had to watch it over and over. And it's it's hilarious. Like, the way the hunters are depicted is great. They'll shoot at anything that moves because they're just hunters, and they have this bloodlust, clearly. Um, but that's where, you know, we have the fire, and it's scary, and uh, it's harming the woodland creatures. Uh, we've got Smokey Bear uh, telling us to prevent forest fire. Like, we have this whole idea in the United States that fire is bad and forest is good end of story right and so that's one way in which the stuff gets criticized um uh, the other thing is for carbon emissions and it's the idea that we have you know plants they breathe in co2 and release oxygen right so it's that age-old thing we learn about we humans we breathe in oxygen you know o2 we breathe out uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, so we're taking in the good stuff, getting the bad stuff out, and plants do the opposite, and that's how we have this healthy system. And of course, one of the big concerns today with climate change is the idea of more and more greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere, CO2 being one such greenhouse gas. So it's the idea the more trees we cut down, the fewer resources we have to take in carbon dioxide and that's a legitimate thought and concern and yes we want to have more healthy forests around the world all right but like this picture here taken in indonesia this was used uh to show just how bad it is with this these carbon emissions and slash and burn agriculture and how it's just just not getting it and we need to to let these forests grow and be left alone all right, we got a few issues with this stuff. Now, number one, <clears throat> I went ahead and pulled this map. This is from the World Bank. We may look at some of this stuff later on um, with the, the actual data resources at the World Bank. This is a fantastic resource for a, a lot of different stuff. Now, this, I simply looked at the latest uh, data we have globally for carbon dioxide emissions per capita in metric tons right meaning per person so we take we, we talked about this a little bit with the population stuff and the idea of like raw population versus population density <coughs> and how or birth rate and death rate and stuff like that how how um that can be be uh, quite useful in in having a rate of some kind so that we don't just simply compare a big country to a little country and of course the big country has more you know, incidents of whatever, um, but it's simply because they have more people, right? We're actually seeing that with some of this COVID-19 reporting. Uh, we have very few maps and images and, and uh, just data coming out that take population numbers into account, right? Or like looking at the total number of uh, cases in the U.S., um, you know, that that's a, a fuzzy thing because we have some key areas where we have a lot more more you know disease spreading new york la or two massive centers but in the rest of the country we don't see quite as much right for whatever reason and, and testing itself is is a whole issue but the idea is that we we want to look at it per person 
if we can in some way or within some kind of rate or ratio to get a sense of actually what's happening. So I just I did this um, in in you know light of if we go back here to this argument that these people who are cutting down rainforest and setting it on fire, they're ruining the climate, and we gotta get these people to stop doing that. But like I said, this is in Indonesia, um, which if you look, I can't, I couldn't embed it to get it uh, dynamic here, but I just copied down some numbers here. Indonesia, so we're looking at this little archipelago thing down here, um, they have in per capita, per person, in metric tons, their CO2 emissions, 1.8, all right? Metric tons of CO2 per person. The U.S., where we don't do the slash of burn stuff, we're 16.5. Right? Clearly, we're being silly when we point to, and we do this quite a bit, and we're going to talk about development and just how we treat poor people, especially poor brown people in other parts of the world. Um, we like to point to them and say, see what they're doing? This is a problem. Not necessarily a problem in this global scheme of things. Right? And same thing, I pulled out the, the Kong of the DRC. Is this guy right here another area where we have you know the Congo is a major rainforest of the world you can see their carbon uh, emissions here again metric tons per person um, 0.06 right Brazil 2.6 so where most of the Amazon happens to be so all these areas where we point to and we're saying my god you know stop this you're being reckless with your resources that's ludicrous that is absolutely ridiculous when we look at what we ourselves are doing right another issue we you know and people can say like yes look okay maybe we do admit more but still these forests these are our remaining forests on the the planet we need to preserve these because without these we got nothing and that's something that we never really question that especially that statement when we say remaining forests which is a uh, a very loaded term that we don't quite question remaining meaning like we had more for us but these are the ones that are left so where were these other ones right where do these other ones go uh that uh is is a perfectly uh good and, and in fact important question yeah we had tons of forests up here and in here uh and over here uh and these these got destroyed uh simply because we needed farmland as we needed to grow. We needed industrial land and fuel and things like that. So a lot of the forests that we used to have are long gone. And it was important to for the you know the developed world to uh, to gain its wealth. Right? The US has a lot of money, a lot of resources today, precisely because we cut down a lot of trees. Same thing for much of Europe, China, similar story there. Right? So a lot of other nations uh, and cultures and societies came into their wealth and their power and their status precisely because they cut down a lot of trees. And now today, now that that's really backfiring, we like to point at some of these other folks here and here and over here. And we like to say, hey, stop cutting down your trees. This is reckless. You're going to kill us all. Right? you got to maintain these forests. And yeah, I don't know what you're going to do for money. That you're on your own, uh, right there. But but just stop cutting down the damn trees, right? That's what we get at. So this whole idea of slash and burn agriculture being this awful uh, environmental thing, we need to really question how is that being framed, right? Now, clearly, we do want to preserve the Amazon. You know, we want to preserve the Congo. We want to preserve these different rainforest and what has recently happened in brazil specifically uh with fire in the amazon has been yeah it's been terrifying there's no no uh reason not to uh to think that's a a tragic thing um you know like the amazon rainforest just specifically for a lot of americans and people in the west it has the, it's this place of incredible just importance and and it's special because it's close to us, we're able to go down and visit it. I've been there. It's it's incredible. It's a wonderful resource. So we don't want to see the whole thing go up in flames. And what we're seeing with like Bolsonaro, the president, the 
far right leader who's being discussed um, right here. He's he's really lacks a lot of uh, um, environmental regulations. He just let these things go, and and is one he's he's you know Trump like in the sense that we don't want to have too much government regulation. We don't want to have environmentalists calling the shots and being in control. Let's just pe let people be. Uh, and there have been some cases of, you know, some of these fires have been simply people setting them to, you know, mess with environmentalists and to prove a point. Like, it, it got out of control during this, this period in the, the summer, last summer of 2019, where this stuff was just all on fire and it was a mess, right? But... Again, there was a lot of, of pointing to this, you know, the poor people, the, the folks who are doing this practice to simply make a living, to, to survive. Like, not even make a living like, you know, have a small business or whatever, but just to, you know, kind of homestead out in the Amazon. And that was encouraged even before Bolsonaro. It was just, it was a way for uh, Brazilians and other people in South America to go out and just, you know, make a living, be able to survive somewhere in this massive massive forest all right so again don't want this whole thing to burn down we want to preserve it but at the same time we need to we need to realize like who who's actually harming it and who isn't right and quite often we blame the poor folks who are trying to grow some food in this this rather you know simple way and of course, if we wanted to, if we wanted to change this for the better, we could, you know, provide for free some, you know, fertilizer and stuff like that to limit the, the burning that needs to be placed or the shifting that needs to take place. We don't see that happening at all, right? We don't see a lot of people stepping forward to do that. We instead just say, this is awful and we got to stop it. Okay? And so that's a lot of this too. It goes back to uh, a colonial mindsets and the idea and this is you know i say colonial tradition of european expertise the u.s is part of that when, when i say european in a lot of these settings it also means the brits as well as the spanish and the french and the russians and all other european groups who came to north america so a lot of our initial ideas in this country in terms of like the Americans, the white folks who are, are having these ideas, it's that European tradition, and it's always this idea of we know better, these people don't, right? We gotta we gotta make sure that we protect this land from these other people because these savages they just don't get it. And so if we see fire, uh, you know, in a forest, we say, well, that's clearly bad. And there are examples of this, like in India, the British, you know rebelled against this stuff they had this very scientific expertise that they they came up with to how to properly take care of the land that wasn't necessarily the best way to do it there was a definite economic reason for the brits to you know think about the best way to do this stuff so honestly when we're seeing this in terms of a slash and burn swidden cultivation thing it's not just you know fire and isn't that a shame it's this conversion of resources right beautiful forest fantastic that's one resource but in a small sustainable way we have a case where it's it's we're just converting it into food uh for the people who live there right and you see images like this one in the lower right these aren't you know massive corporations going in and slashing this stuff down and burning it in this way that's happening in the uh the Amazon and other parts of the rainforest, and just other parts of Latin America. We'll talk about a little bit of, you know, more about corporations and all that getting involved here in a moment. Um, but it's when, you know, it's these poor folks who quite often are blamed um, at the expense of the real villains when it comes to environmental degradation or labor issues or, or stuff like that. Right. So just think about that as you're hearing about this stuff, you know, in the news or, or whatever. Like you try to question what's going on here, right? Think like a geographer about this stuff. All right, let's move on. That's way too depressing. Burning rainforest and all that. Let's talk about another type and another region, um, although kind of close. But we see this primarily in 
Southeast Asia and the, the Southeast part of China, we have rice paddy farming. And it doesn't mean that's the only place where this <clears throat> takes place. I mean, we grow rice here in California, but that's really the, the you know, center uh, of this stuff and where it, it came to be. So, and yeah, here's our map here. I'm trying to be a good geographer and put in maps and, and all of that. So these farms, the little rice paddy farms, are relatively small, um, like Swinton cultivation. That should be traditionally a relatively small area. Um, but at the same time that these things are, are relatively small, kind of seem to be low scale stuff, this, is, this isn't a sustainable process, right? This is, is food being produced for a market. So rice surpluses are being grown to be able to take this stuff, take it to a marketplace, sell it, make some money, right? So it's more industrial in that sense. And really to make the most of this small area uh, and these big markets to sell this stuff at, there's this process of double cropping, right? So it's the idea that a crop of whatever, you say corn here in the U.S., that we have kind of this sense of like how you're supposed to farm. You've got your planting season, you've got your um, growing season, your harvesting season, and this whole thing takes a calendar year, right? You plant, I, I don't know, I don't in the fall maybe, I guess, um, and you, you know plant the stuff and it grows throughout the spring and you harvest it in the summer or whatever, and then you you know you start the process again, right? That's the uh, that's the general idea with with agriculture for most Americans. But double cropping is where you double it. You have two planting seasons, two growing seasons, and two harvesting seasons. So you're again you're trying to make the most of this land, and it's a very intensive process. Um, and you can see, I mean, with the pictures, it's it's always gorgeous. This was always, I mean, I, I don't know if I've talked about this with you guys before, but I've always had this. Um, issue like with, with wanting to drop out of college right like you guys i'm sure have gotten to that point already where you've at least once said like oh, what am i doing here i should just drop out right and if you haven't you will if you don't ever have that feeling i don't think you're doing it right you're not pushing yourself enough or whatever you're not i don't know you're not healthy um but yeah for me it was always like oh man this is all nonsense i gotta drop out uh, and I was like, I don't know, I'll just, I'll write a book. I'll write this incredible novel and I'll sell it and I'll become, you know, this in famous writer and I'll talk about how I dropped out of college and, uh, you know, didn't need it. What do they know? You know, that kind of stuff. And of course, then I realized, like, ah, oh, but that means I have to write a book. Uh, and that was way more work than just studying for the test or whatever I was freaking out about. So I never did it. Another thing, you know, when you're naive, um, and a, a young man, I, I think it's, you do this, um, but it was the idea of like, oh man, I'll just drop out. I'm just going to go work, you know, on a farm. I'll have some kind of, you know, romantic living in nature kind of experience. Like looking at a rice paddy like this, like this just looks sexy as hell. Doesn't that look fantastic? You know, I'll just, I'll just do that. I'll get this real experience and I'll be happy living off the land. And of course, this is before robots could take all of this stuff. So that's whenever I look at this stuff, I just think about how fantastic it would have been to to drop out and and then I think now too like thank God I did not do that because I'm way too soft to be able to survive on a farm at all right um, so yeah so anyway it, it's very intensive in the sense of uh, uh, this double cropping you can see water is involved it's a water heavy process here but in Southeast Asia got a lot of rain coming in so that that works. But of course, as you're taxing the soil, just like with the other stuff we you know just talked about with the swin cultivation, eventually your plant food gets used up, right? And so you need to have some kind of way to fertilize it, all right? So like this guy right here, what's he got in that wagon? I'll wait. I can do with all these classes. I'll let you raise your hands. And yes, you. Uh huh. What is that? And you probably said it's manure. That's usually what students will say. And manure is what? And people say it's, it, you know, cow poop. Or it's probably from these donkeys. They pooped. And that's fertilizer. And I tell you that, oh, that's precious. Um, 
yes, manure is something we can use. Uh, but you know what's even easier than manure? Uh, it's called night soil. Now, anybody know what night soil is? That's one of my favorite concepts. Night soil is uh, it's human poop, right? Used as fertilizer. And I know what you're thinking now. Ew, that's yucky. Ew. Yeah, it's gross as hell, but it's also gross to put, you know, cow poop on stuff or any poop uh, in general, right? But for whatever reason, we think like, well, that's okay to put the cow stuff on there, but people poo? Ew. Uh, and then the next reaction to is typically like, oh, Asians are so savage and all of that. Uh, you know, like, oh, oh, you know, I wouldn't do it. My people wouldn't do this stuff, right? Wrong. Um, actually, we see night soil has been used. I mean, that night soil, that's a, an English term. Uh, but this has been used by everybody. We see with the agricultural revolution in, uh, in England that led to the Industrial Revolution, that led to Europe really, you know, becoming Europe, being able to, you know, go out and conquer the world and all that stuff. A lot of that is based on this idea of night soil. And it was actually a case where you had people that were called the night soil men, where their whole job was to go out and it was like they would go early in the morning, like, you know, it's still night. I don't know if this is exactly where the name comes from. But it's the idea that they would go out while everybody's sleeping, um, you know, in their beds. The night soil men would ride around with wagons and they would go. And this is, you know, we're talking like in London before we have, uh, you know, indoor plumbing uh, in the, you know, the same way we have. You would have a cesspool. Uh, it's the idea that, you know, your toilet was literally a hole in the floor. So you'd, you know, poop through that and it would go into this little collecting pit right you uh and then but there was a door to the the outside to the street right and so the night soil men would come they'd open up that door shovel out the waste collect that and then take all of this out to the farms in the more rural areas and sell this to farmers right and then as you you know have more of this fertilizer you're able to grow more food you have more food you're able to have more babies more babies means more poop, which means more fertilizer, which means more food. And this also gets into the whole population explosion that we talked about previously, too. The fact that we just started getting more and more humans throughout the world. Um, a lot of that comes from just realizing how to grow more food, how to not die, right? And how to keep our babies healthy and, and so on. And that just continues to, to greater and greater numbers, right? That's what the whole night soil men thing, uh, you know, helped right there. That we could make more food in a place like England, which would, you know, then these ideas would go elsewhere. And pretty soon we have billions and billions of people on the planet. So we can see, and, you know, there's this is still used in more rural parts of the world. Rice paddy farming isn't, you know, unique. It's not the only one here. Um, you know, we, I mean, Portland, I think they do this a lot too a lot of you know hipsters um we're getting into urban agriculture and stuff we'll talk about in a little bit um you know they're responsible for for doing some of this stuff and i should say like if you um like if you hear this you're like that's not gross man that's awesome i got a garden in the back and i want to start doing this i do have to warn you um i'm not an expert i i've never done this myself but it's there's like a composting process that goes on like don't poop directly onto your tomato plants or whatever um because hey that's gross and what will your your neighbors think um but at the same time um it needs to like you you put the poop in the corner and you let all the i don't know griblies die or other good griblies kill the bad griblies or what i don't know i don't know how it works all i know is don't poop directly on the plant right but that's that's just one of the fun things uh about this stuff and and you know and hey that's how rice is made yeah. All right, let's talk um, plantations now. And this plantation agriculture can be everywhere. Uh, we've seen it throughout the global south because it's been directly related to colonialism. This image comes from India. It's a tea plantation. When we hear plantation, we tend to think of, you know, the American south and the Civil War and all that. We don't have 
operating plantations in the South anymore. When slavery is abolished, those go away. They still exist. They're now weird historical sites where you can like go sleep in, you know, fun little cottages and all that. And then you realize, oh my God, these cottages were the slave quarters. Um, initially, they don't look like that today, but I mean, that's that's another discussion for another time. It's It's creepy as hell. So we don't see this in like Louisiana or Mississippi anymore, um, but we still have plantations around the world. Okay, so as I said, the global South, uh, which we've talked about before, it's the idea that more or less, um, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, specifically, but also you know, beneath about thirty degrees uh, north here, so everything south of there is for the most part poorer countries. Right, and and we'll get into why we have poor countries, but really, the reason why we have these things uh, is because of colonialism, keeping these things poor, and then you know modern economic uh, systems helping to keep these things poor. So we've seen these historically all over, right? In you know West Africa and South America, as well as like I said, the American South and India and Southeast Asia. So we've seen plantations everywhere and the whole idea the one constant thing is it's been a massive amount of land that's been held to uh to just make as much profit as possible okay and so with these um you know if you're going to have this massive amount of land you need a lot of labor to work the land and a way to ensure maximum profits is to have slaves do the work Right, that you can force people to do this stuff, not pay them anything, keep them alive, you know, with enough food and shelter to just keep them living, but force them to do the work, your profits are going to be fantastic. And so, initially, you have this two class society uh, where you have the slaves, uh, and then you have those who are, you know, enslaving the people, right? The people in charge and the people. Who are doing the work, right? We still have plantations today. We don't have slavery legal, um, you know, at all on any of these things. But wouldn't you know it? We still have two class societies at work, right? You have the people who are doing the work, and they live on the plantation most often, uh, and so they're doing the work. They're getting paid technically, but it's a pathetic, you know, pitiful amount. A lot of this stuff, it's not taking place in, you know, on American soil where we have labor laws and stuff like that. It's in places where these labor laws have been relaxed to allow for. And then you have, you don't really have the, you know, plantation owner in the same way, like some, you know, wealthy family that owns this stuff. Now it's a transnational corporation, but it's still the same idea. Super elite in charge, super impoverished, you know, doing the actual so we, we still have this going on today. Right? And this work, too, to be said, is grueling, awful, miserable stuff. Like the pictures of plantation work, they never give me that same romantic feel like the rice paddy stuff. Uh, it looks awful. This is sugarcane in the Caribbean, um, which if you've never worked with sugarcane, it's, it's miserable. I had a job where I had to do stuff with it and it, it's always kind of stuck with me how god awful it was but it's you know it's thick and, and can be sharp and and sticky and and gross and so the people here like it's incredibly hot as they're working they're covered up um it's not for warmth or whatever it's so they don't get cut up and banged up um you know from the the plants themselves or the machetes or or whatever right so brutal awful work um and with this, it's, you know, the initial concept of, you know, plantations in, you know, the Americas uh, or in South Asia or West Africa or wherever. Uh, a lot of people have argued this was kind of the first concept of globalization, this real transnational concept where we have different nations, although the concept of nation, we'll talk about that later. That's kind of a, a newer thing. But still, it's the idea that you have work being done over here being controlled from these folks over here it's being shipped to this other place like it's this global enterprise and it's still done in the same way so like i said we don't have the owners we don't have that family living in the big house or whatever 
but we have these transnational corporations um, like, you know, Chiquita, Del Monte, uh, these different, you know, massive groups where they're headquartered in the global north, in the wealthy countries, uh, and then they're, but they're doing the work in the global south. So it means not only do these products like bananas or pineapples or whatever, not only do they get picked up from this, you know, one place and shipped to American supermarkets, uh, but the profits also come up here because it's where the people in charge actually exist and live, right? And this helps to go, it goes to explain why a lot of these countries are still so poor, right? It's, it's because the, the profits as well as the resources are leaving this place. And it's why we are so wealthy, right? At the, the same time, it's, it's one reason I should say. You know, there's also a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of environmental issues where this mass production of food, it's harming, you know, water resources and soil and things like that. It's, again, keeping resources out of the hands of the indigenous folks or the, the people who, you know, live there in this country, in Ecuador or Nicaragua or wherever, keeping the resources out of their hands. And it's, you know, northern companies operating using this stuff like Del Monte and some of these I mean this you know a lot of this stuff sounds like Chiquita it, it all sounds very Latin and and you know like it's you're helping support some some Latin company when you do this stuff like Del Monte it's headquartered in San Francisco it's an American company that presents this very Latin flair um, but all the profits are coming here to you know wealthy folks in San Francisco right so the it's an issue and you can see this. This is, uh, I didn't take this photo. I stole this photo, but I love, I just love it. Um, so I don't know exactly where this plantation was, but um, this is a sign on the plantation itself. And it's a great example of how, uh, how you can tell, right? Just like going to a place, doing that actual field work, getting on the ground, looking at stuff and critically reading the landscape. It's a great example of how you can see really what's happening. So the sign, and don't worry, I translated it for you uh, if you don't speak Spanish or Espanol as well as I do. Yeah, I, you guys have already seen me. Um, I'm terrible. I, I stole this translation too. I think it's legit. Uh, but the sign says, Welcome to Freehold Plantation, a workplace where labor harmony reigns. In mutual respect and understanding, we united workers produce and export quality goods in peace and harmony. That sounds great, right? Like plantation should be fantastic. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, what do you guys think? Do you hear this? Does it make it sound like everything's cool? I pause, like I'm waiting for you guys to respond. Uh, I'll never get over that. All right, so yeah, you, you look at this, probably you get the feeling like this. That sounds kind of lame. That doesn't sound legit and so you know you want to ask like, what is it how do i know that stuff isn't right here and i encourage you like if you it's not already clicking pause this video look at this try to deconstruct what's really going on okay and so and now you've paused it and you've thought about it and i'll just explain stuff so a few things like well number one the fact that it's called freehold plantation that's some creepy slavery nonsense uh, right there, right? It's saying they're not slaves or working there. That's just the, the, you know, name. I mean, that just gives you chills of, of evil, um, as you hear that. But one key thing is just like the words themselves, the fact that harmony, um, is, is repeated here, right? Like just, and, there, and there's some, it's the harmony, it's respect, it's understanding, it's peace. Like there are all these words that just keep getting thrown out there. Right, and it's the idea, like there's that Shakespeare quote, uh, was methinks the lady doth protest too much, right, which is rapey as hell. Um, fellas, no means no, and all that, but it's the idea that you keep, you know, to keep protesting, to keep saying something and something and something and doing it too much, that it means the opposite, right, which you can't, it's like if she says no, and she keeps saying no, she really means yes, no, no, that's that's rape. That's awful. Boys, put this in your notes. Um, but it is a case where you do have some, like it's, you know, if you get accused of something, you want to be able to handle it 
cool or it, it looks like you're guilty, right? Uh, that's kind of what's going on here. They're like, oh, it's peace and it's harmony and respect and everybody. Lo- oh, it's fantastic. Blah, 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 blah. They, the fact that they keep going on about it means it's awful, right? So, like, just the words themselves, that's the thing. The, the 65 here, students kind of question that. I don't know what that is. If that's, you know, what? It have, relates to some or a part of the plantation. I don't know. We do have a little dove here flying around. That's that's cute. Uh, there's some more peace and stuff like that. But then one, I think, a really important thing is right here. That Del Monte logo has been defaced, right? So it's the idea. I can just picture it. You know, a truck of workers coming through, uh, and they, they see this god-awful sign that the management put up. They had nothing to do with. Uh, and see that, and they just cross out the logo right there, right? It's just... It's just saying, up yours, this place sucks. All right, so that's what's going on. But at the same time, bananas are delicious. So, you know, and we need our coffee and and all that. There's another thing to think about is how does this stuff, you know, affect our daily lives, right? And the the goods that are produced here. It's, It's something to think about. And again, we'll get into that more when we get into globalization. We'll talk about that at more length. And so in kind of contrast to the uh, plantation concept, we can just have simple market gardening. And this can take place anywhere, but I think this is a good example of one uh, such concept taking place not too far away from where historically plantations have been used and where currently plantations are still being used. And so this, if the, you know, the flag and the uh, the iconography on the wall and all that doesn't give it away. This is in Cuba. Um, I forget exactly where um, this was, but uh, got to go and and uh, tour this this uh, farm and and uh, meet with people. And they had presented here a lot of tropical fruits, the the same kinds of things that can be mass produced on plantations, but these here were produced by the uh, very people we were meeting, and we did not have that two-class society. There was no massive transnational corporation that owned this, uh, uh, you know, the farm itself, um, was not paying for the labor. Uh, co- uh, Cuba is communist, right, as we know. We're technically socialist. I think next time we're going to get into um, the distinctions between socialism and communism and and what like democratic socialism means when it's used by a guy like Bernie Sanders versus you know Fidel Castro kind of socialism. So we'll get into that. Is it next time or the time after that? Um, but the idea is you don't have this private ownership of something like this farm. Instead, you've got you know the people working for the good of the state itself. Right now, this particular farm. I mean, you can see. In here, it's a very modest uh, building in which we're standing. You uh, leave that building, and you can see, I mean, it's just, it's perfectly uh, cliche, kind of quaint in how rural it is, complete with the chicken walking across the road. Uh, But I, you know, got a tour of this facility. It actually had a museum, and I took a picture of this little map that they made of the farm itself, of the property, the fields, and where they lived, and and all of that, and that's not something you're going to see on a plantation, right? Because that's not the people's homes who are working there, even if they are living there, right? It's never actually theirs, whereas this was theirs just simply because, you know, they're the people, right? There's no private ownership necessarily, so they don't actually own it, but at the same time, it's theirs because they are Cubans, right? That's the the idea here. And so the the different products would be, you know, raised here, harvested, and then these two would go off to markets. Like here's one in Havana. So selling, you know, meat and produce and and all of that. So if you can see the pineapples in the foreground, these are going to be things that have been produced here in the, you know, the general area by, you know, actual labor, not by the the plantations themselves. They're not imported from, uh, um, 
you know, these very capi capitalist uh, um, entities, right? So you can just kind of see this difference in the sense of, you know, producing the same goods, but with a different system in place. And that's something for Americans that I think is worth looking into. And I'll probably talk about Cuba again. And, and it's not a case like some people like to uh, do where it's just to say like, oh, those people, they such beautiful people and they really know how life is, is supposed to be run and all that. Like, I'll be honest, you can pay me to uh, live in Cuba. Um, I mean, mainly because of the humidity, but other other reasons um, for that as well. So it's not to say that we all need to be commies and life is going to be great here, but there is there is something to be said for, uh, you know, scale and the industrialization of stuff. Like here in the U.S., um, with our you know, the type of, of agricultural production that we do, one big aspect is what we call livestock fattening, where, yeah, sure, we could eat grains, we could eat corn, soy, you know, whatever, or we could feed that to delicious animals like these cows right here, shove that into them, get them nice and fat, kill the cows, eat the cow, right? Brilliant. Uh, and so that's that's what we do. And, and honestly, this is not for me, too, to, to say that, like, and therefore we shouldn't eat meat because it's mean to kill the cows or whatever. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not going to lie uh, about this stuff. But again, it's an issue of scale. Uh, and we here in this country, we, we have what we call confined animal feeding operations or CAFOs, which, you know, people call a feedlot quite often, where we just, you know, it's it sounds much more scientific and it also sounds less cruel uh to say that we're just you know if you look back here you know, we're just shoving a bunch of big animals into a little area but that's what we do here all right and again it's the idea we grow grains you'll be able to feed those grains to the animals themselves get them bigger get them fatter and then we get more meat right whether it's you know beef pork whatever it might be and we see this around the world other other countries do this, but we were the best. Uh, and I'm not sure as to whether or not we invented it, but I mean, come on, we probably did. And we, we, you know, we are the, the main source of, of, uh, doing this kind of practice. Now there are all sorts of issues with it. Um, the obvious one is like from an animal rights standpoint, allegedly, I mean, I don't know, look at those, those cows look happy to me. They have a little neck rests. I mean, how nice would that be to be able to eat and, and rest your neck on something while you get, you know, like all the food they could possibly want just thrown in front of them. Pretty nice. Uh, okay. So there, I mean, there's the, yeah, the animal rights issue that we're just not, you know, treating our cattle or whatever, um, in the nicest, uh, way They don't have the nicest conditions and all that. It also turns out it's incredibly inefficient though in the fact that we're actually throwing away food for, you know, what we get in return, right? So we take the statistic, it's something like 21 pounds of protein in the sense of like coming from, you know, soy or whatever, whatever protein we're giving to these creatures uh, through the grains, right? We put in 21 pounds and as a result, we get one pound back, right? So, you know, think of it as putting, you know, 21 pounds of, of corn, of soy, or whatever, and we get a pound of hamburger at the end of this, right? Um, that's inefficient. We're throwing food away. Now, that end result, I'm not going to lie, is, is way more delicious than, you know, 21 pounds of corn uh, or whatever. I'd rather have that steak. Uh, but still, it's a case of it's an inefficient Thing. And this gets into, like I talk about this in some of my other classes, a few of you have heard me rant about this, but it's a case of as, you know, we have more people in, in like in the United States who need more and more food, it might be better to be a little more efficient with how we produce food and where that goes and stuff like that. But we don't. And that's because this is incredibly profitable, right? That's why we do it. And that's what drives a lot of our industry, our agricultural industry, right? It's to make a profit. That's what the goal is. You go back to like the Cuban market garden um, that I just showed. That's not about making a profit. It's about getting food to people, 
right? Um, and that's, you know, I, I get it. You know, we want to make a profit. We want to have money so that we can buy the stuff that we want. But it is, it's just something to, you know, worth questioning in terms of, you know, how much of it should be about profit and how much should be about feeding Americans or humanity in general or whatever, right? And so a lot of what we do here, it's purely driven on this idea of let's maximize profit. Same thing with the grain itself that's raised for, whether it's livestock fattening or to, you know, make flour and bake bread or whatever uh, it might be, um, that is also quite a, a profit-driven industry. Uh, and it's another case of, you know, here in the U.S., we dominate a lot of stuff. Um, but these statistics here, I think, are quite telling, and this will help make sense when we get into development, make sense of the fact that, you know, the, uh, um, why these other countries are poor and still seem to be poor. These first numbers, the U.S., Canada, Australia, the European Union, and Argentina, um, they make up 85% of the wheat that is produced and sold all over the world, right? And so to say the EU, that kind of lumps in some other countries there, but let's say it's, what, 10, 15 countries all together out of roughly 200 countries that exist, right? So this tiny little minority has a majority of the grain production that is done. And you can also see here, U.S., 70% of all corn that is produced around the world. It's very hard for other economies to, and other, you know, industries um, to compete with us, right? If you have farming going on in a country that isn't mentioned here, and they're trying to produce wheat or corn or whatever, how can they possibly compete with such a massive entity like us? Right. It's like it's the same story where we had, you know, about how, you know, Walmart uh, killed the country stores or, you know, now we're looking at where Amazon is ruining just stores in general and all that stuff. It's very difficult to compete with this massive player. Right. And again, a lot of this is all about being profitable. Right. And it's less about this idea of just family farms and, and farmers themselves. And this is something that that. Uh, a lot of, of people are trying to to push um, and and get out there. Just this concept, and it's been like this for a while, but this concept of the family farm and farmers as just, you know, independent entities, while there still are some of these independent farmers out there, it's getting smaller and smaller, um, the amount who are just farmers, right? As opposed to massive corporations or billionaires who want to just, you know, do something else with their money and invest here, um, or, you know, it's hedge funds. Like, it's all sorts of weird financial stuff going on. So, like, with grain farms, we kind of have this this uh, vision of, of simple family farms not quite there uh, anymore. Like this picture right here, kind of like a, like a field of dreams kind of vibe. Um, if you've ever seen that absolutely ridiculous movie. Just, you know, it's just the sense of in the Midwest having a small family farm. This is actually, I didn't take this. This is a Google image search. This is actually in Lithuania because um, I couldn't find any good pictures of good little family farms here in the U.S., right? They just don't seem to exist. A lot of these things are called suitcase farms with the sense that it's uh, the actual owner does not uh, sit there and, and live there and, and exist there. The owner is headquartered someplace else. And then when it's time for the harvest uh, to act, or even, you know, the planting or you know, like whatever it might be, you've got these workers who start in one end of the farm and they spend that whole season, you know, working from one end to the other. And it's highly mechanized, a lot of big tractors, a lot of machines, and that's also changed stuff. And not in like that robot farmer kind of way necessarily, but still... There's this idea of, of farm labor is getting, you know, it's changing. It's getting more and more complex, right? This idea of just the, you know, individual laborer with hand tools going into a field, doing the work, that's being replaced. A bunch of individual laborers are being replaced by one person 
um, who is, you know, educated to a certain extent uh, to be able to operate high tech machinery and computers and all that stuff. There's one person replacing all of those individual low skilled laborers. So this image in the lower right is showing the whole concept here is within this big tractor, um, it's got GPS as well as GIS set up, right? So GPS, remember, that's the global positioning system. It's our satellites that tell us where we are at any given moment. So it's got that, but GIS, as we've talked about in the past, geographic information systems, that's the actual mapping component. Because frankly, like who cares where you are if you don't, if you can't do anything with that information, right? So he, you know, in this setup here, the idea is you're on on the farm, you're in some field driving along, and you can map out and, and test the soil, right? So that you, you know exactly where you are on the field, you test the soil initially to get a sense of what's in there, right? Where do you have just the right amount of nitrogen and potassium and all this important stuff, the plant food, right? Where do you have the perfect amounts? Where are you deficient in this stuff? So, you know, too little potassium, um, or not enough nitrogen, but the potassium is fine, or whatever, right? So you can drive around, map this stuff out, take individual soil samples, do that stuff, get an idea of what the soil is like. Then you drive this rig around, and you have a trailer, you know, hooked up to it with a fertilizer ready to be pumped out, right? But the GPS is telling you where you are on that soil map. Right, so you know exactly where you are in terms of are you in the area where everything is just right and it just needs a little more fertilizer or where it needs a lot more nitrogen than it does potassium or vice versa. Uh, and you can, you know, based on that, the computer in here will mix the fertilizer so it's this perfect custom amount so that the soil is flawless, right? So that it has the perfect amount of all of these important chemicals to help the plants grow. And so that, and you can, you know, I'm not knocking this or whatever. It's, you know, it's good to be efficient with this stuff. We got seven and a half billion people around the world. We need to be efficient and just smarter about how we're growing stuff. But we also need to be aware of like what goes into farming uh, and how high tech it is. And again, what does that mean for these laborers, right? And it's like, we go back all the way back to the bell curve talking about that and how they're Ernst and Murray are talking about how dumb people had a place on the farm and now it's like no no that, that doesn't work uh in this way you have to have a computer science degree to understand how this stuff works I mean you know an electrical engineer or whatever so it's it is radically changing right? and again here in this country a big part of that it's it's efficient but it's it's efficient in the name of profits and quite honestly it's profits for the shareholders or the you know the billionaire couple who already owns the land um you know it's not profits for that you know small little family that's just you know doing the good work out there on the field right that's that's what we're changing uh dairying you know this is just gross let's just move on that is, oh, you can smell it from here um so but it, you know same kind of deal with all the other American style stuff. Um, you know, we still see <clears throat> areas of the world, though, that aren't, you know, fully into, you know, driving profits and stuff like that. Nomadic herding exists in some, you know, few spots around the world, like, you know, Mongolia, where you have this very semi arid region where you, in order to survive, you have to be nomadic. You have to move your animals from one place to another to move with what little rains you have and therefore what little grazing lands you have and stuff like that, right? And this is something, and I'm not going to dwell too much on, on this. I talk about it a little more in some other classes, but it's, it's just the idea that this was a traditional way of dealing with, um, you know, with livestock. Instead of doing that livestock fattening, you could, you know, you would move them from place to place and that would re replace hunting so it was easier in that regard but we you know of course if we like we have stuff like property uh and stuff like that here so being nomadic doesn't quite work uh and it's just way easier to keep all of your animals in one place 
and you know bring irrigation and bring all the resources there and fatten them up. Now we still in this country we we do something kind of like this, except we just call it ranching. And the difference being is that it's you have one fixed location, right? And then you send your um, you know your cattle or whatever out to graze on lands, and we have all sorts of grazing rights, like out here in the West, and that causes trouble, and it brings you know government in with with private citizens, and there's a lot to talk about with with that as well. But that's the the general idea. We don't have nomadic peoples so much as we have ranchers who have one big ranch, but then they have through government programs they're allowed to take their animals out to let them graze other land um, to kind of move with the seasons and to also not fully destroy this one plot of land well you know the hundreds of cattle or whatever are there in this picture um does this conjure anything for you guys make you think of the marlboro man remember talking about that wonderful ad campaign that's the vibe that's why i picked it this is another google image uh search that i did and what's great about it, i mean it just looks so rugged like well this i mean this looks cool from like a national geographic kind of sense this is i mean that's America, right? And I just love like the dog that looks like you know that could be a wolf that just came out of the forest. It's like I respect you, cowboy. Uh, you know, I'll, I will you know walk with you as you take your cattle to to Montana to wherever. Um, so this picture though, this has nothing to do with actual you know macho cowboys or whatever. This is to sell luxury properties uh, in Colorado, right? So like you know million dollar ranch property and stuff like that that the people who can afford it they won't actually be on horses like that they won't actually be doing any work uh in this regard but it just it gives you that you know if you're a millionaire and you're like you got some money to spend you see this you're like yeah i want to be a macho guy and you can buy that and you can pay a guy like three bucks an hour to actually do this stuff right that's that's what we do yeah um but again that's a lot of this stuff is going away the idea of ranching in this country is is getting to be just as you know distant a concept as it is uh you know like nomadic herding is in other parts of the world we're seeing less and less of it and again it's because of the profitability it's because of how hard it is to do this kind of work as opposed to doing the livestock fattening or the you know grain farming or something else where it's just you're you're got a better chance of making more money right making a a bigger profit now the other thing though this is what I want to wrap up with here, is that this urban-rural divide is getting fuzzier. And we're starting to question, like, should, do we even need it, right? And, and so there's a big question of maybe we've done too much, and should we instead bring this agriculture back into city settings, right? Instead of having the city, where no farming takes place, having the country, where all the farming takes place, then we take the food from the country, that goes into the city, and the money goes from the city into the country. What if we start doing more farming in the uh, in the cities themselves? Because we have all sorts of issues with, you know, specific, the poor communities primarily, uh, where you just don't have fresh foods, fresh produce, and and good food, and all that. It's more it's packaged and processed stuff. There's a real concern starting, you know, over a decade ago when people really started paying attention to it in recent years, but just the idea that, nutritionally speaking, people in inner cities were suffering. And so one way to deal with this has been, you know, to have this revamp of urban agriculture, which is nothing new, but it's something that, like I said, within the last decade or so, people started taking seriously and thinking about. All right, now this image here, it's hard to say that this is urban agriculture, but this is, this is another Cuba picture. This is right uh, on the edge of Havana. So the, you know, the big capital city uh, on this island, very, very urban place. There's no denying that, but just right off uh, the edge of it, you have this pretty massive farm. Uh, and so this is was a, a real push to get more food. And this started in the 90s where this uh, was happening, but to get, you know, more and more produce, fresh food. And, and some of this would go to like that market that we saw earlier. Um, here, I just love this picture just because of the two guys. This is kind of like, you know, old Cuba and new Cuba where you've got the guy 
in the gear, in the Che Guevara, Fidel Castro army gear on the right. And then, you know, the way that younger Cubans look, which is just, you know, like how pretty much anybody else looks, just, you know, wearing Adidas and, and jeans and all of that stuff. Um, but both of these guys working on this uh, this urban farm. And as I said, this was around the 90s where this really took off, and it was all part of this government-sponsored program, as we see depicted in the sign right here. But it was when the Soviet Union fell, when they were no longer the Soviet Union, right? Communism failed, and they broke up and became Russia. Um, that really affected a lot of countries that relied on the Soviet Union for aid and support. So just like how we in this country, we send you know, financial aid uh, out to countries or military aid or food aid and, you know, that kind of stuff to other places, you know, not just out of the kindness of our heart, but to build up allies and all that. The Soviets were doing that as well. And they pumped a lot of money into Cuba because it freaked us out, right? <laughs> For no other reason, it freaked us out. And it helped keep Cuba communist and, and you know, not falling to the American empire and all that stuff. But as soon as the Soviet Union has gone, all that money has gone. So the government has to figure out a way, okay, how are we going to ensure that we stay stable, right? What are we going to do? And so this idea, this new concept of agriculture was set up, and primarily this urban stuff around Havana and some other cities uh, was set up, not just to get the people farming, but to allow the people working there to take a certain share of the profits, right? Which doesn't sound very communist at all. It doesn't sound very socialist at all. But it was the idea. It's still technically state-owned and all that. I, I, just, I don't think there's any actual private ownership still with this stuff, but profits can be had. And you can, you know, you can say too, that like, how is this, um, you know, purely communist, but it, it, it works. It, there's nothing really hypocritical about what's going on if you really get into you know this idea of of the absence of private ownership and and all of that um so it technically works from an ideological standpoint here but what it also does is it makes people like these guys right here they're very happy because a they're making a little more money than they would anywhere else so they're living very comfortable lives but b this was one of the most just attractive places um i've been to just a very you know nice outdoor feel just calm serene so these folks get you know more money to work in a nicer area than they you know would be getting if they're you know driving the old 57 chevys or you know working here doing this stuff or, or whatever it's a really good life and therefore it's been successful these folks have an incentive to keep it going and so that's producing a lot of food for the uh, the country itself, and as you step away from the um, from the farm itself, just like across the street, I can't really, I don't really have it here, but that farm is just right here. And then across the street, you've got this Soviet-style apartment blocks set up, and there's a little stand where you know anybody who lives here can just walk over, get fresh food, go back to their apartments, which is pretty pretty nice, right? And so this, I mean, this could have been held up as a great example of like what could work um, for urban agriculture stuff here, but they're the commies and we don't trust them. So, you know, this has never made it over here at all, but it, it really clearly is a successful operation. Most of what we've seen in this country has been uh, less successful, um, we'll say. And so a great example is South Central Farm, which is in, was in, I should say, spoiler alert, um, was in South Central LA, right? Or what we just call South LA now, I guess. We're kind of rebranding that so it doesn't sound quite so, you know, rioty. Um, but it's, it was a direct response to the 92 LA riots, right? So the Rodney King beating, the fact that the, you know, all the police officers were shown on tape just beating the hell out of this guy, the fact that they didn't go to jail, they were, were not, you know, seemed to be guilty of anything causes the city to corrupt. There's violence, there's fire. I mean, it's just a really ugly, ugly uh, moment in LA history. And of course, not the only riot that's happened, not the only case of 
racial injustice or anything like that. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff that as you start doing the research, you see, oh, this was nothing new. Even though, like, for me, as a kid, you know, watching this stuff on TV, I'm thinking, this is this is crazy. And, and no, you later learn that, no, this this happens. Um, and so, yeah, the, the riots happen, and it's, it's awful. But one way for the residents of South Central to deal with this was to try to build this community garden. Okay? So they move in to this abandoned lot and you can see it here when it was actually going uh and so you have like warehouses and stuff all around and i mean south the, you know south of downtown south los angeles all these these areas that we how we're going to say it uh it's a very industrial area right um so not a lot of green space and so this there was nobody was using the land at the moment so the community moves in and they start farming they start growing you know produce and crops and stuff like that growing flowers you can just see how green it is so it's a way for the community to kind of work together to actually you know produce something rather than tear stuff down it's something for you know families to get involved with and kids to get involved with and all of that that's what it's there for um but the key thing is nobody owned this land who was using it it was privately held and i believe it was a case where it had like gone into some kind of tax default the uh, la city owned it simply because somebody didn't pay money for it right so the the city owns it at the time um when people are in here farming they don't do anything about it but in 2003 they put it up for sale it's sold to this private landowner this guy ralph horowitz who just he wanted to buy the land and put up some warehouses, right? To, to have a, some kind of shipping logistics facility or whatever, because that's what this whole area was zoned for in the first place. Now, clearly this guy would have known what was on the property to start with, right? No one's going to spend millions of dollars on some you know land deal in LA uh, and would not having seen the property or at least have a sense of what's going on. So clearly the guy knew what was here. The LA City Council knew what was here, uh, but they sell it to the guy. And it's time to start bulldozing, time to start tearing this farm down to put up the uh, the warehouse. And now hopefully, at this point, you, you're falling into one of two camps, right? You're, you're either going like, God, what a monster, right? We need to, let's keep this farm alive. Let's fight for it. And then there's the other camp where it's like, well, what? It's I mean, it wasn't their property, right? The guy bought it. Let him do whatever. That's, you know, that's typically how we divide uh, on this stuff. Well, when the, the bulldozing starts, there were protests, all right. And one thing L.A. has that really helped this out is there were all celebrities, right? I don't know if you can tell. This is Daryl Hannah um, getting, you know, pulled away, protesting, fist up there. And I know a lot of you are saying, what's a Daryl Hannah? She was really big in the 80s. Um but yeah, we had, you know, movie stars and rock stars and all sorts of people coming out to protest this. Um, and, you know, at one point, uh, you know, Horowitz offered to sell the property. Like, God, if you guys want this so much, I'll just sell it to you. And, and a lot of the celebrities put their hands down right away and started whistling and kind of walked away. Because it was, you know, it was a cool thing to show up to and be seen at. But you didn't want to actually, you know, spend money to help brown people or whatever. So... That didn't quite work, but then some people said, no, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll buy it from you. And then Horowitz, uh, apparently he said, uh, oh, you will buy it? Well, I'll sell it for this much. And he like quadrupled the price of the actual property or whatever. And it was just a whole mess. Every, yeah, he was being a jerk and other people are being jerks. And, and meanwhile, you have the real actual Angelinos like this guy right here who just want to, you know, have a garden have, you know, a little section of this farm and, and have something that isn't miserable and awful, right? But these, the, you know, the actual South Central farmers themselves, little power in this case, it's really, you know, LA itself, it's, you know, wealthy landowners, developers, and celebrities that are doing a lot of this stuff. And a lot of you, there are appeals and courts, and I mean, there's still nothing built on the land itself so it's just been since you know 2006 where a lot of the stuff is getting torn down up until now 
There's nothing. And it wasn't until in 2019 the city council approved the actual building of warehouses. It looks like they're moving forward. The argument is that, well, yes, you know, the, the people here lost this, you know, green resource or whatever. But these warehouses will bring jobs that these people need so that they can have a better life. It's a complex, pretty complex thing um, in terms of, you know, what's the best move forward. And like I said, it's a case of, you know, some people say, this is nonsense, let these people have the farm. And other people say, this is America. We live, you know, with, with capitalism and real estate laws and, and stuff like that. These guys didn't own the land. Um, you know, let this guy build his warehouse. Uh, and I'm, you know, in the sense that I, I do think that it's a shame this farm is gone. Um, you know, that said, you guys try to farm something in my backyard. I'll, you know, I'll get the gun. I'll kick you out. Uh, but this, this wasn't just, you know, property that, that um, you know, some individual owner had it was like la if they had done a good job which you yeah, know spotty record uh, on that it would have been nice if instead of selling this land like just you know get some federal grants turn it into an official park and just let it be right because you see i mean that picture just showing that it's this little oasis of green that's a great a great thing to have um today this is what it looks like right so here's the the original look here it is right here um, just bulldozed brown dead. And what I, I forget what were we saying early because we were talking about deforestation and climate and stuff like that. Were we saying something about how we wanted trees and stuff? No, we're gonna pave this, put up some uh, some steel buildings right here. It'll be totally fine. All right, so that's I mean that's absurd. Now don't worry, these poor farmers they're not totally out of luck because some people have donated property in fact right here you can go to the web you know southcentralfarmers.com and you can see there's still this co-op that exists sells food uh and if you read it here uh all produce is grown and harvested on land that is currently leased by the south central farmers co-op located in bakersfield california now i don't know if you guys are familiar with places um South Central. You can't see me right now. I'm putting my hand stretched out way over here. This is South Central. And then I stretch my other hand way over here. Here's Bakersfield. Um, pretty far, right? How How is that supposed to be a community garden when you have, and I think it's a case, uh, I don't know if it says here, but it's like they, they have like a van or a bus or wherever where some people can go up during the week and tend to the property. But I mean, that's, you're talking like at least four hours, if not five or six hours, you know, round trip traveling there. And like, who, who has time for that? Right. So, I mean, this is clearly it's screwed up this whole system, but this is what we should be thinking about here as we're moving forward. I mean, apart from robot farmers and, and just robots in general, taking over the world and taking our jobs and how we're going to deal with that. Um, and it's also like, what are we doing with our, our space, right? And, and space in the sense of, um, you know, like in the geographic sense here, our spaces, do we want to have spaces of, of, you know, greenery, um, like we see here, do we want to have spaces where we're producing food for people or do we want, you know, these logistical spaces of, um, you know, online shipping and commerce and stuff like that, which is also, can't deny this, that's becoming incredibly important, especially in light of the fact that we're all stuck at home right now with the coronavirus thing, and we're ordering from, you know, Amazon or Target or Walmart or whatever it might be. We need more warehouses. So that it's it's a it's a complex thing. It's not an easy thing. I mean, I clearly am not hiding it. I have my thoughts uh, on this stuff and just the you know the idea of the lack of of green space and just los angeles in general is a a bad thing uh and in cities in general it's a, a bad thing we do want more of this stuff um but it's still it's something we need to legitimately think about as we move forward all right and are we okay with instead shipping folks out to bakersfield i don't even think it's bakersfield i think it's like closer to the hatch i don't even know I haven't been there um, but you know, is that, does that actually 
make more sense and we can save the city for more urban stuff. Should we go back to this more urban rural divide, but just work harder to get more produce into the inner city? I don't know. Like I keep telling you guys, I'm going to be dead in like two years, three years, whatever. I've had a good run. These are the kinds of questions that I can throw out there, but I don't have to answer. So I'm not going to be around that much longer. Uh, but you guys, you 18, 19, 20 year olds that are listening to this, it's it's something to think about, right? So there you go. That's enough farm stuff um, for today. I'll, I'll chat with you about something else uh, equally exciting, equally uplifting, not depressing at all next time. All right? All right. See ya.